All right, guys, joining us here on Submission Radio is the man who brought light and attention to stories and the reality behind Russian MMA. He's an associate editor from Bloody Elbow, and you may also know him from his work from Sports on Earth. Karim Zidane, welcome back to Submission Radio. Dennis, Casper, it's good to be back on. You know, I'm lacking sleep, but I can never say no to being on your show. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's the way we like it, man. I feel like most of our interviewees are uh, like that as well. So it's, it's a huge pleasure to have you on. It's been far too long. Now, before we get into your Russian adventures, of which there are many, let's discuss Fedor's fight against Fabio Maldonado this past weekend before we actually get into what went down. We got to ask you about the commentator, Roman uh, Mazarov. I mean, it was indeed some of the strangest and funniest commentary we've ever heard. Uh, Twitter blew up. Everybody was talking about it. What do you know about him? And as an M1 commentator, how do you rate his work? Okay, so Mazarov is an interesting character because I, I know I know pretty much everyone got got to know him yesterday because yesterday was the high profile show with Fedor on it, mm. and that's fair. Uh, to be honest, I only arrived. I got off the plane about an hour before Fedor's fight. By the time I was home, it was exactly about a minute into the opening round. So I only caught his commentary for pretty much that last fight, and nothing else. And I, all all my uh, opinion of him basically is based off previous events and the sad truth is his his understanding of uh, women's mixed martial arts and his opinions of it and what people saw as uh, brutal honesty yesterday i think came out a little too much when he was talking about women's mma and how much he can't stand seeing pretty pretty women get punched in the face and how they should probably find other jobs like modeling or something else <laughs> oh, to make man. more money so right. that left a very bitter taste in my mouth and i haven't appreciated him much since but to be honest he was far more objective. To give credit where credit's due, he was far more objective yesterday than I could have ever imagined for a Russian commentator to be. Let's, in, let's contrast it with the actual Russian commentators and that actual broadcast, which was a lot more cautious, a lot more uh, tongue-in-cheek with that sort of uh, uh, honesty regarding Fedor's performance and the scoring of the fight and whether there was... Uh, a little bit of controversy in the end there. So the Russians were a lot more cautious about what they said, whilst Mazarov had absolutely no problem whatsoever. The thing is, from what I've heard from people, is he's, he came out of nowhere. He And pretty much his association with, with Fight Nights has been all that people really know. But for some reason, Russian fans don't really appreciate him very much. When I see mm. posts about him on VK, they're always making fun of him. I don't know if it's because <laughs> he's doing the English commentary, to be honest. I don't know enough about him but based on that honesty from Fedor's fight maybe he's uh, turned a new leaf in that regard but uh, I, I implore people to listen to go watch any of the old events where he was uh, where there's any women's mixed martial arts fight on there and you might change your minds about him that's the only disappointing thing about him there in that regard other than that for someone who's doing what I believe was a solo job there for like what was it 15 fights I can tell you guys I do I believe 10 fights for a regular M1 show and as much as a lot of those fights will be entertaining, you have a good time. I work with a partner like Ian Freeman, which is always a blast. Mm. It is difficult. It is difficult to keep your focus and attention for six hours and to try and be as excited fight after fight and to not make mistakes. So one way or another, it's a difficult job, and I appreciate him doing it in that regard. But uh, – yeah, I really hope he changes his mind about women's mixed martial arts. Yeah, we, we certainly hope so too. Um, and yeah, it can't be understated that doing commentary you know, as a solo job is incredibly tough. Add to that, I think there was a bit of a language barrier that made him sound a little bit aloof. I think maybe some things would have translated better in Russian. Um, Probably. Some hilarious moments. I mean, the whole thing was like a car crash that you couldn't, you know, look away from. I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't watch the fight without being completely aware that, you know, of everything that he was saying. You know, a lot of times when you watch UFC fights, Joe Rogan and, and Mike Goldberg, they kind of fade out into the background. This guy, he was the star of the show. I mean, some of my, fa some of my favorite lines and just, just the moments when he was essentially cheering Fedor on, like he wasn't really commentating. <laughs> One of the times he was like, no, 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 better defense, better defense for Fedor. Like, I don't know what that really means. And uh, th there were just moments where Fedor would, uh, you know, throw punches at, at Fabio Maldonado. He'd be like, yes, go Fedor, go Fedor. <laughs> yeah. I believe at one point, even, I believe at one point he completely ignored one of the fights and was, 
I believe, hitting on one of the women or something like that. That's what I was following along on Twitter, and I saw him apparently he was macking on one of the, the some one of the women cage side at one point <laughs> instead and focused his attention on her and a pretty lady cage side instead of talking about the fight. Yeah, these things uh, sort of happen in Russia. You know what I mean? <laughs> mm, this, yeah. he, he, old old Roman. He's he's a man of a man of no country. He he's a renegade. He does whatever he wants. Um, there was also so. there was also that awesome moment when he's like, "What the hell is going in on in the octagon?" <laughs> It's not an octagon, and it's like, as a commentator, you probably shouldn't be saying that. Um, probably, but to be honest, I highly doubt anybody's truly watching over what he says. I can tell you right now, Camille, you saw it from the MMA Hour, he doesn't really speak English. There are not many people from that Fight Night's PR team that actually do speak good English, mm. nor from Fedor's actual team. That's what makes it so difficult for me to be in touch with any of them as well, believe it or not, mm. compared to, say, ACB or M1 Global, where there's enough English speakers, or I mean, decent English speakers, where you can communicate with everyone without without a sort of a problem fight nights was not the same in any way i'm quite surprised they, they them and the ufc uh, seem to have a, a mm. good partnership in that regard so I, there must be someone who does but i truly wonder if there's anyone actually watching over what he says it doesn't seem like the ufc is very concerned they're probably happy that they're this is in, it's engaging fans in some way shape or form I can't see that unless he becomes a lot more controversial like he was in that first event, they'll f find any reason to step in and stop him. What a, what a lucky man. He can basically do whatever he wants, <laughs> and he, he has no boss looking over his shoulder. He'll, he'll, he'll get, get away with everything. The other, the basically other, will. The, the other two <laughs> hilarious moments was when he, uh, the crowd was shouting Fedor, and uh, his, his commentary, I, and I quote, <laughs> I think you remember this one, the crowd oh, is yeah. shouting Fedor, Fedor. That, that means Fedor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Brilliant, brilliant commentary. Thank you, Roman. Thank you for your insight. And then there was the brutal one at the end where Fedor, you know, if, I don't know if he, they'd actually called out the decision, but he was nah, like... I haven't. I hadn't at that point. There is no reason for him to be proud of himself. I was like, holy shit, dude. This guy is brutal. He pulls no punches. Yeah, yeah no, that was very impressive. It was hilarious. And it, what I, I also loved was he was just making decisions on his future as well throughout the fight. I don't think he should go to the UFC after yeah. this performance. And then he was also, um, he was also, he also said that Fedor won before they actually called out the decision. And, and, he, know, and he said, of course, Fedor will get the victory. Yeah. It's like, really? Before anything even happened, before they even read it out, he already admitted that Fedor won. He was also had funny moments where he yep. started complaining about Maldonado not fighting anymore. What the hell is wrong with him? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Why is he not fighting? <laughs> yeah. In the second or third round. And I had yep. this feel, I, I was like, a part of me was like, yeah, he's tired. A part of me felt like one of the creepy mafia guys in the front row, like, took their thumb and went across their throat. Yeah. At, at, at Maldonado in the corner when they were looking across. So it was pretty funny. I also loved how the camera showed the dudes up the front, but the dudes didn't want to be on camera. Mm. Like, <laughs> the camera guy like, you better not show my face here. Yeah. Someone's going to get hurt. The whole thing was hilarious. But look, let's get yeah. into the fight. I mean, Fatal was almost finished in the first. However, ended up surviving, surviving and winning the last two rounds. Kareem, I want to get your thoughts first on his performance. What did you think of the way he fought in this fight? You know... It's very hard to deny that Fedor has changed a lot from the, from the Fedor that he used to fight back in the day. And I, and I don't mean that he's deteriorated or that he's aged. That's that's pretty obvious. I mean the style of fighting now. Yeah. The, all you're seeing from him is a, is a, is a puncher at this point, mm. really. That's not what Fedor used to be at all. That's not the Fedor I fell in love with. That's not the Fedor pretty much anyone fell in love with. Everyone remembers the vicious ground and pound, the crazy submissions out of nowhere. Mm. That's the Fedor we all remember. That's, that arsenal seems to be entirely gone. I, we don't even. I don't think he attempted a single takedown yesterday. I don't know if you guys saw one. I definitely, did not, I, I definitely didn't see one. So it's really disappointing to see that his style has changed entirely. I personally blame that on the fact that he has, first of all, created his own team around him again, out in Stario School at the Alexander Nevsky team. He still has the same coach, Vladimir Voronov, who, let's face it, has aged a lot and does not have many, many great fighters on his roster anymore. He's not rising up the way Abdulmanap Magomedov is, for instance, and uh, picking up fighters who are legitimately in the UFC at this point and actually influencing their career. Like, you see someone like Rustam Khabilov, how he's, how he's improved over his past two fights now that he's training with Abdulmanab Nurmagomedov. Vladimir Voronov has nothing that he can say of that standard or that um, uh, that purpose at that point, really. All he has is Fedor. He's lived off that, uh, that resume, basically, that he's been there throughout Fedor's career. 
And the mm. sad thing is, you're seeing both of them at a stalemate at this point. No one's evolving, no one's changing. You're seeing nothing new. If anything, you're seeing him get worse. He's devolving. He's degrading mm. as we as we go on in his fighting style. He's he's surrounded by a team that includes uh, Viktor Nemkov, La Vadim Nemkov, uh, Kirill uh, Sidernikov, who's uh, known as Baby Fedor. He's got Anatoly Tokov at the team. And he actually had uh, former M1 uh, ch middleweight champion Slava Vasilevsky as well training with him for this one. But the truth of the matter is, none of them are really going to push Fedor a uh, fight. They're all in awe of Fedor. Whatever Fedor says, whatever Fedor's, wherever Fedor is fighting, that's where they're fighting. For instance, Anatoly Tokov just won the ACB middleweight title. But instead of defending his title, as soon as he realized Fedor was going to be on the Fight Night 50 card, he did not renew his contract with the ACB, told him, hang on for a while, I'm just going to go fight on this Fedor card because he's on the card and I want to be with him, and then I'll come back to you guys. Wow. So he, as a champion, he had no problem saying, hang on, hang on, hang on, take this belt back for a while. ACB doesn't have an exclusive uh, contract to, to, to maintain a fighter once, uh, once he's a champion. So that's not a clause that's that's uh, that's in the contract. So he actually was allowed to leave because he, did, he his contract was up. But it's just the idea that they're willing to step away from whatever they're doing to be on Fedor's card. They're in awe of Fedor. He's a hero to them. He's a legend to them. They live out in the forest with him in Stary Old School. That's in the middle of nowhere, Russia. Just to let you know, it truly yeah. is out in the middle of nowhere. You've got to take this long night train out from Moscow if you want to get... It's, it's just a disaster, really. And uh, yeah, you watch training videos and it's... You think you're watching a bit of CrossFit and a bit of like spar punching, and it's just it doesn't. I'm not seeing anything impressive out of it. And you really, you saw that in the fight. The fact that an inflated light heavyweight, hand picked by Fedor, was actually able to do what he did yesterday is just. I, I don't know if to say it's unbelievable or if people really expected it, if it was predictable at this point, but it was certainly disappointing. Yeah, and I mean, you, you look at the way Fabio Maldonado dropped him. I mean, those are punches that I think Fedor would have, the old Fedor would have slipped. I mean, you can clearly see that Fedor's reflexes, his speed is just going down. I mean, he looked every bit of 39, and I think it's just one of those things that age catches up to you. And you, you phrase it beautifully and perfectly, Kareem, that, you know, Fedor, what made him so dangerous for many, many years is exactly what he stopped using, and that's his complete skill set. You know, where's where's the Sambo? Where's the takedowns from the clinch? Where's the casting punches that, you know, he used to set up those takedowns and those throws? He doesn't use them anymore. He basically just goes in, goes for the knockout, and tries to get out of there as quick as possible. And, um, and, and, and yeah, he, he certainly paid for it. And it's like, you look at Fabio Maldonado, a guy who prior to this fight, lost to guys like Corey Anderson, to, who got destroyed by Rampage, creamed by Stipe Mirchich, Glover Teixeira, and then you got guys like Igor Pokryats and Carl Kingsbury, who were never, you know, the, the best of the best as far as elite light heavyweights go, and yet he almost finished, you know, the, the great and legendary Fedor, and, and, and even a guy who's not known for having stoppage power. You know, one thing about this fight, to me, and uh, I realize we're going to talk a little bit later about, you know, Fedor and the UFC and stuff like that, but kind of, I wouldn't say opens your eyes, but kind of confirms the fact that he wouldn't really do very well in the UFC when you compare the Stipe Mirchich to Fabio Maldonado fight, and then you look at the way Fabio Maldonado almost, you know, destroyed Fedor. And, and this is a fight, mind you, that should have been stopped in the first round. There was about two or three instances where I think that fight could have been stopped. So all in all, I would give tons of credit to Fedor for being so tough and, and, you know, being willing to continue. But a huge part of that is, you know, because of the referee. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll tell you guys what. Going into this fight, I thought Fabio Maldonado was going to be a problem for Fedor. I told you this, Casper. It was off the record. <laughs> and you told me Fedor was going to try and take him down. We all thought, and I said, of course he'll try and take him down. That's the logical thing that was going to happen. But that's <laughs> not what happened whatsoever, which... Again, Kareem, to your point, I don't know who's coming up with the strategy for these fights. We all saw in the first round, Fedor comes out, just throws those punches, isn't covering up, and expects to knock out Maldonado. And he realizes Maldonado is still standing there. I think there's a moment when he steps back and realizes, oh, shit, I think we might have <laughs> underestimated this guy for a second here. And it's, it's exactly what you guys said. I don't want to repeat everything, but even when he throws his punches, it's like he doesn't cover up. He's just swinging wildly. And... He, there's no slips. There's no real strategy. He doesn't go for his, his strengths and his skills and doesn't look at the opponent's matchup. It's like he just goes out, whoever the opponent is, and just does what he does and just believes that, hey, I can go out there and just do this. And this is 2016. He was already, that game plan was already not working for him in 2009, seven years ago, may I add. 
And the other thing that people aren't realizing is um, Maldonado, even though he hasn't had the best record in the UFC, he's the toughest opponent Fedor's faced since 2009. I believe he last fought Dan Henderson, maybe Bigfoot in 2009. And ever since then, we all remember he fought uh, Hizo, Monsoon. Monsoon, um, he fought, um, obviously, you know, in Ryzen. Uh, these JDC, guys are, yeah. not, uh, are not world beaters that he's been fighting. These guys are very, very low, low level, old old fighters. So we're seeing where he's at against a guy like Maldonado. And Maldonado is not terrible, but he is not an elite UFC fighter. So I think, like you ca mentioned, Casper, really sort of makes you think about what he would do in the UFC. And we'll get to that point in a second. But I just want to quickly go around and ask you guys. I mean, the fight was deemed a decision win for Fedor. Many had this fight a draw. I want to find out what the general consensus was from you, Kareem. And also, can you tell us a little bit about this judge, this uh, female judge, I believe, who actually scored it um, towards Maldonado? Or towards a draw, I think. No, she did score it as a draw. But to start from the very first point, to be honest, it's, I think the fight was a clear draw. I think it's very clear, really. 10-8, first round, Maldonado. If he did not score that fight at 10-8, I don't understand. Do you want mm. to see his head decapitated mm. for it to be a 10-8? What's left at this point? That is 100% a 10-8. He was, uh, I, I've never, it's been a long time since I've seen Fedor beaten up that much in such a short period of time. And it's, it's, it's incredible how anybody could think that that was a 10-9 by any way, shape, or form. It's crazy. So the way I saw it was that the fight was a draw. It had to be a draw. And it's disappointing to see what was happening the whole time because I don't know how many people knew this or at least knew this right before I put mention it on Twitter. But all the officials in the, in, the, in the arena that night were assigned by the Russian MMA Union. Mm. The only – okay, the Russian MMA Union was founded by Vadim Finkelstein, the same founder for M1 Global. And he separated from it. Because he's one, he wasn't going to run a promotion at the same time, run this MMA union and assign officials. And he decided to, to, that the best idea was that he would place Fedor as the, as the president. And everyone it was basically unanimously agreed upon. The big legend at the time, well-loved icon in Russia, has the respect of ministers and the presidents alike. That there was no doubt he should be assigned that position and that he was going to be able to run things quite smoothly because of the respect he would garner. So they said that Fedor would be president. He's reigned as the president ever since. I know many believe that he resigned from that position once he uh, actually returned to fighting, but that was not the case. Because when I was in Orenburg a few weeks ago for an M1 show, part of that same show, it was a co-hosted co show with the Russian MMA Union because they, were play they, were, they had their amateur championships. I don't know too much about the amateur championships because I actually wasn't doing commentary for that, and we showed up at the arena right after it finished. But Fedor was right there, front and center, in his suit, and coming in and handing out medals and awards and everything afterwards and being announced as the president of the union. So I don't know what they're placing it officially as, but I was there witnessing it with my own eyes as he was still being announced as the president of the union. So the fact that there were judges and a referee that were basically scoring a fight and doing their jobs for their own boss mm. was a massive conflict of interest. And a few people asked me this yesterday. Was is there any other way around it in Russia in the first place? Is there any way for this not to be controversial in Russia? Aren't the judges and officials generally Russian? Well, that's not actually the case. I've seen it in ACB and you've seen it in M1 multiple times. Fighters are actually allowed to request to have judges and referees that are not from that country, or at least a certain percentage of them. You're allowed to have a referee from a neutral country and at least one or two of the judges from a different country. So that's actually something you can request. And I know this because after the controversy in the first Alexander Shlomenko and uh, Vasislav Vasilevsky fight from February uh, on the M1 challenge card, when that decision was considered uh, somewhat controversial, Slava actually appealed to the Russian MMA union. They watched the fight to try and see if there was a discrepancy there. They apparently analyzed their judges and whatnot and decided that there was no discrepancy, but that if there was ever a rematch, Slava would be allowed to have a certain percentage of the judges not Russian and uh, assign a referee from a neutral place. I don't know oh, why wow. he was that concerned, though, because they were both Russians, though. So that's a bit of an odd situation mm. in, in its own in itself, but it still it suits the point I'm trying to make in the sense that you're allowed to have neutral officials. That certainly was not the case with Fight Nights yesterday. They were not very concerned who they had there. But there was one very impressive representative there yesterday from the judges, and that is Maria Mach I forget. Hang on. Her last name is Maria Mahmutova. Mahmutova. Sorry, she's not in front of me right now, the name. Give me, give me a second. Yeah, Maria Mahmutova. 
she's extremely impressive. I don't know too much about her just yet, but she was the only one who scored the fight a draw. And I got to watch a Match TV clip. Match TV was the, mm-hmm. the Russian channel that hosted the fight, because I know most people watched it on Fight Pass. But yes, it was hosted on, on Match TV, and they actually grilled her after the fight for her scorecard. They were asking her questions like, they were bringing out arbitrary situations and hypotheticals from the UFC. They're like, well, how about this fight? This fight was difficult to score. How do you score the fight if you say a fighter is punching the person for the first half of the round and then the other person gets a takedown in the other half of the round? Who actually wins that round? Do you really think that you should have scored this a draw? Is this really a 10-8? But in the UFC, they didn't score this fight a 10-8. They were really grilling her. Oh, wow. So they actually brought up old old UFC fights. Oh, they certainly did. Really? Wow. uh, Oh, yeah, 100%. I actually have the transcript in front of me and that's going to be part of a, a part of an article I published on Sunday so it's 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 going to fascinate you the things that they were willing to say and how she handled it so incredibly her answer in the very end was look I trust my training I was trained by John McCarthy if I have any nice. questions or any concerns I reach out to him and no one else now that really impressed me I mean she has guts and courage to be the only female there, knowing mm. the Russian culture, especially in the mixed martial arts community and combat sports in general, towards female athletes and females females in general. Like there were comments on VK saying, what's she doing outside of the kitchen? Go make me a sandwich. No, seriously. These are actual legitimate comments that she received after this. And she actually talked about it on the clip and Match TV decided to ignore it and move on to the next question very quickly, as if that was not a point of concern to them. It was a very disappointing show in many, many regards, just because it showed a lot of the weaknesses of Russian MMA overall. Instead of trying to fix it, Fight Night seemed to uh, bask in its glory in some way. And that was very disappointing. Like, It was fun in the sense that you got to see the, the spectacle of Russian MMA, but you also got to see everything that makes it mm, amateurish. Yeah. And that's what really got to me with the show yesterday. You Mm. got to see all the possible conflicts of interest. You got to see what corruption is like when it's linked to it. You got to see the political influences that are lined up. And what really is at stake and what's at play when big fighters like Fedor compete on a show in Russia. It's uh, it's alarming in in many ways, really. And it's not the only time this has happened. I mean, Fedor generally attracts this sort of uh, elite class when he's fighting. I mean... It's not the only time this has happened. There was one time when Vladimir Putin, Russia's president, appeared Mm -hmm. at an M1 event for Fedor. And I believe it was the Jeff Munson show, if I'm not mistaken. And he was booed by the crowd. And this was right before his elections. So there's always been very interesting things that happen. And then the whole crowd disappeared that night. (laughs) 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 They requested Uh, a crowd promptly. People were like in their nightgowns and stuff. (laughs) Yeah, I I, 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 a huge, huge, (laughs) massive respect to Maria for doing that. You know, being the only woman to to you Mm. know score. Not only being the only woman there on the on the on the judges' table, but you know, having the balls to you know dare to stand out like that. Needless to say, I think what you saw on Match TV was probably before she was taken into a room, interrogated, and most likely uh. waterboarded. And uh, ho- hopefully we hear again from her. But yeah, I'll just quickly give you my thoughts on, on the fight as well. Or really, there's not that much to say. I think the fight should have been stopped in the first round. And if you're going to take it to decision, it's a draw. Simple as that. I, I, don't, I don't see how you can really argue any other way. Yeah, exactly. I thought it was a draw, and I think definitely in the first round, I think someone else was officiating it. I think if you had like a Herb Dean or something, I think it would have definitely been stopped. But let's talk about Fedor possibly fighting in the UFC. I mean, Casper, you addressed it earlier on where you said after watching this fight, there's a little bit less interest in seeing him go to the UFC. I want to go around and get your guys' opinion. Do you think at 39 years old, and coming off this fight where he did take quite a bit of damage, do you still want to see Fedor go to the UFC? And also, let's have a bit of fun here. Give us a matchup if he was to go to the UFC that you think would work for him. We'll go with you first, Karim. Well, uh, and this this actually links back to the KO bit for a second, if he was KO'd at the fight, because I want to actually quickly mention that and say, mm-hmm. I did not see that coming from Fabio Maldonado at all. And that, was, that automatically sucked the wind out of the idea that he would go to the UFC. And I'd like to also point out the point of the referee, another official that was assigned by the Russian Union. That does not mean necessarily that Fedor himself handpicked the official. 
but it does not change the fact that this referee was refereeing his boss that mm. night in the cage. There's no mm. doubt about it. So, yes, he was definitely a little more lenient. I've actually seen uh, Victor, Victor Kornev at M and M1 events before. He's played the role of judge and referee at the events before. He's generally very well respected. I'll say that much about him. He's That might be the reason why he was picked for the fight in the first place. Usually when he's at an M1 event, he's given uh, one of the higher positions, one of the leading judges or officiating roles. So he definitely has respect in Russia. I have not generally focused on his fights and whether he's big on early stoppages or not. I'm not necessarily stay, saying that there was a fix in or anything of the sort. Mm. I'm saying that he was in a very difficult position with the conflict mm. of interest, and that was evident yesterday. And the truth of the matter is, he should not have been in that position. That should not have been the case. We should not have had to have someone officiating their boss in the first place. What happened yesterday could have been truly dangerous for Fedor. If he had taken too much damage, or he could have been truly seriously hurt, we don't know how seriously hurt he was. His face was carved up like a pumpkin yesterday. We really don't know how bad the damage was yet. He says there was a there was a, a release that came out st shortly thereafter saying Fedor suffered no injuries. I don't know what Russians consider injuries at yeah. this point. Fedor <laughs> suffered no injuries. Like, what is going on here? Oh my god! <laughs> he, he's laying on on a table. There's flies around, and they're like, "He's fine. He's fine. He's just sleeping." <laughs> exactly. So so this take this leads us back to the UFC point. I I'm terrified at the idea of him coming to the UFC. If he comes to the UFC at this point, give him CM Punk. Like there's no one else. I can like it's either that or. Brock Lesnar. I truly don't want to see him against any legitimate professional that is capable of fighting in the UFC. From any weight class at this point, I'm done. I, this, is, this is not fun anymore. I don't understand why it has to be, why Fader has to be this exception or why people believe that he is immortal or he's drinking from some unknown fountain of youth. He is a man and he is human like the rest of us and he ages just like the rest of us. Mm. We've seen it time and time again. Why does he have to go out the way Chuck Liddell went out, the way Tito Ortiz and all every, the way everyone seems to go out, all these legends? I don't understand. Why is everyone waiting until that one big massive KO where he has to be woken up, told what happened and made to leave the arena? Like, why mm. does it have to end this way? Mm -hmm. <laughs> why? And the sad thing is, we're going. if he doesn't fight for the UFC, it actually, it might be for the best if he fights for the UFC. At least he'll be dealing with the most decent and this is funny that i will say this the most decent group in mma at that point because with the, with with the commissions with whatnot at least someone will be there to stop the fight sooner if something happens but if we continue to see fights in russia the problem is a lot of people invest in these fights we're talking about a lot of rich people who have a lot of interest in many different things and a lot of different stakeholders who want to at least see a show put on in the end too many people are terrified at the idea of stopping a fight like that too soon and Fedor, whenever he's going to be headlining a card, we're going to see scenarios where fights go too long like this, where beatings go too long just because they cannot, they cannot have something like a quick stop. You can't have Fedor. Imagine that had happened. Fight stopped in the second minute and Fabio wins. Crowd goes silent and an amazing mm. night is shattered just like that. Big investment blown out the window. They can't use him again to get Putin for any reason. It's never going to work. It would have been a disaster, and that referee would have been out of a job for good. He yeah. would have been and treated his horribly. Would have fans. For the rest of his life. <laughs> well, say, say that doesn't have to happen. Say it doesn't have to go to that extent. At least he will be vilified by all the fans. They will mm. threaten him. They will send messages saying, "Where can I find your sister and your mother and whatnot?" These things do happen. These mm. things are said to people. I have seen messages sent like this to fighters, to referees, to officials. It's happened time and time again in Russia, especially when things are at stake. When Fedor fights in Russia, it is not a safe thing. I'm not saying this has anything to do with Fedor himself. I'm saying there are a lot of other stakeholders with a lot on the line at that point, and they don't want to see their investment go just up in flames, mm. just like that. Yeah, well, look, I'll, I'll put it this way. The whole, uh, I guess, appeal of seeing Fedor fighting in the UFC was see if he can actually fight, you know, the best of the best. Uh, and we're not talking about Pride Circuit, you know, 2005, 2006. We're talking about, you know, the current UFC landscape. And, you know, Fedor talking about how, you know, he believes he, he can be champion and he, he wants a rematch for Brito Verdum and all these guys. And at this point, it's pretty clear that he wouldn't be able to... I, I don't really think there is many, if any, winnable fights in the UFC uh, for Fedor. I mean, I looked up and down through the top 10, or sorry, top 15 in heavyweight. I don't know if Fedor beats any of those guys, even even if only for the fact that these guys have all been fighting at a higher caliber and facing better competition this whole time. So, 
I personally don't want to see Fedor. I don't know who who you'd want to match him up against uh, that doesn't essentially destroy him at this point. I think the dream is shattered. I don't think there's any reason for him to go there. And I think, you know, people are talking about light heavyweight and him going to light heavyweight. He just fought a light heavyweight. Exactly. And not, not a very successful light heavyweight in Fabio Maldonado. So, you know, to, to, to those who think that, you know, maybe a drop down to light heavyweight is the answer, I don't think he'd fare any better. I mean, those guys, you know, the thing about Fedor, it's not like he's losing his knockout power. He's He's losing his speed and his reflexes, and that would probably be magnified if he went down to light heavier, which he would never, ever do. He's got people who are willing to pay, you know, top dollar for him so that he can stay, you know, at heavyweight, stay round, and fight guys who aren't, you know, on a lower level. There is no way he would put in the, you know, the time and the effort, and I don't want to say Fedor's afraid of hard work. That's not what I'm trying to say, but I just don't see why a guy his age who is, you know, already set in his ways would make such a drastic major change and say, all right, I'm going to shed, you know, 30, 40 pounds or whatever, 20 pounds so I can make light heavyweight. It's not going to happen. And like I said, you look at Stipe Miocic who destroyed Fabio Maldonado in around about 60 seconds, and he's Fabio Maldonado essentially destroying Fedor in a fight that should have been stopped. It, it was it was pretty much the same fight, just in reverse. I can't see Fedor being, you know, competitive at all against a Stipe, against a Verdum, against against an Overeem, against a Junior Dos Santos, against any of those guys. Um, it would know, be criminal. It would be absolutely criminal to place him against those fighters. Yeah. All the fighters you just mentioned, that would be criminal if mm. the UFC decided to ever do something of that sort. That is my personal opinion of it. He should be, no, and this is no disrespect to Fedor, the legend, his legacy. I am not very concerned with what these fights mean for his legacy things like that don't bother me too much although i do think he's treading on roy jones jr to yeah. like levels at this point right now which is sad and it's and it's not sad because of all oh, what roy jones was it's sad because he has it's, it's come to this it's come to him just fighting in russia for rich billionaires and oligarchs just for their entertainment and he gets knocked out in no time it's sad mm. that this is mm. what we ha what athletes have to resort to sometimes and there's a lot of things that go through people's lives that that they have to end up in these positions. And I think fans and people in general just don't think enough about why people have to take these fights or why they come back from retirement or why they just can't let go. And a lot of it is a lot sadder than people imagine. It's not about Fedor being too much of a fighter and thinking he can win all these fights. I've heard many, many different stories. I don't know what I believe and what I don't believe. But if you believe some of the rumors, Fedor was in a bit of trouble financially and this is one of the reasons why he and he wanted to he's leveraged so much money out of his last two fights and he was able to do so and come back in general it wasn't necessarily just because of a, a, a fire or his his will to return that could definitely have been part of it i mean he's a fighter he's a long time fighter i mean I, I i do commentary with ian freeman and all the time ian looks at me he's like ah i wish i was still fighting he knows better than to do that now he knows better than to do that now, but he still will turn to me and say, ah, it's this, this brings back the itch. Every time he sees a good walkout or sees a good knockout, he gets that itch again. And I can understand fighters doing that. I'm not one personally, so it's, I can't speak from experience, but I've seen it in front of my own eyes. So that's one of the reasons possibly he's coming back. But you got to think there's a lot more to it. And it's just sad that we have to see fighters br brought down to this level, especially legends, people who are so mm. well looked up to. I mean, when you see, when I put up a single tweet about Fedor now, the... It's all negative responses. It never used to be like that. Mm. It never used to be like that. There was this glimmer of hope when he came back as well that maybe this is it. Maybe he just needed that time off and things were going to change and it was all going to be different. But the negativity is surrounding the whole thing now. It's sad more than anything. I've got nothing at stake here. I'm not concerned one way or another. It's just sad to look at it from a distance and say, wow, this is what it's come to with Fedor. It's no longer, we're no longer talking about the greatest of all time. Uh, undisputed it has become not just disputed it has become laughable sometimes when people mention that he's the greatest of all times isn't that sad in itself once upon a time there was no argument about this there wasn't and now it's and now people are just looking at him as that guy who's fighting for billionaires for their fun and entertainment and that's about it mm. if you really think he's going to go to the ufc i'll tell you personally i always believe that all those comments about him going to the ufc were well Put together, if you truly look at the wording for each of those quotes, and I made sure whichever ones I personally translated were looked at by Russians, etc., etc., and confirmed that this was the exact wording. He was always very smart with the way he said it. There was never any necessarily any uh, solid confirmation that he was actually in communication at that moment with the UFC. Saying something to Ariel like, we are closer now than we were before, doesn't really mean much if you were... Because here's the thing. Last year, I can tell you this as a fact, 
Vadim got Fedor a phenomenal contract with the UFC. This has this happened. He did. As soon as Fedor came back, he he called Vadim and asked for Vadim's help to go to the UFC. This is what I was told by multiple sources. Not one of them was not Vadim himself. So anyway, this happened. Vadim reached out to the UFC. Fedor said he wanted the contract sent by mail. The UFC sent the contract. Vadim couldn't believe himself when he saw that contract. And Fedor instead showed up at a Bellator event without telling Vadim and without telling the UFC. Wow. So that's what happened there. When people are like, no, he didn't get a good deal. People didn't. Yes, the UFC bent a lot of agreements and and Fedor agreed to a lot of different things. There was no co-promotion. There was no interest from M1. Nothing. This was all about Fedor. He cut ties. That's, That's exactly the moment where he cut ties with with Vadim with M1 in general and moved on to work with Ryzen and uh, as you see from then on it went he went to uh, eastern uh, fight nights or Asian fight nights it's really the promotion's called fight nights global i'm not quite sure where the EFN uh, label ca- came from but uh, yeah so it's it's a very confusing story with Fedor it's really hard to gauge where he is at all times it's really hard to understand Different people are saying different things about where he's at or why he's doing things. He know he sacked the majority of his team, so it's not like F- Vadim is no longer his manager. Their 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 deal was done when Fedor originally retired. When Fedor came back and called him up, that was just as a favor. He was asking Vadim for help to get him to the UFC because it was Vadim who had been in touch with Dana before in the past. So that's what happened in that regard. But their their deal had had been done for quite a while. But Fedor still had an entire team around him that was helping him while he was at the Russian MMA Union. That entire team fell apart this included marketing staff this included really really close advisors who had been around for a very long time he sacked them all one by one for different reasons he is no longer surrounded by that same team i could not recognize a single member of the team when i saw them in front of my eye they were on the same plane as me back from orenburg i couldn't recognize a single person there except his wife that was the Mm. only recognizable person from his team the entire team has changed. He has a new press secretary. It's impossible for them. If you're, if you're an old journalist who's been around for a while and you're trying to get in touch with Fedor through your old contacts, you're toast. You're never going to get through because none of them work with him anymore. There's a lot of people willing to talk about him now that they no longer work with him. And that's where things get really fascinating. That's where they get really fascinating because you start to understand the psyche of the man himself. A lot of the times, it was the team that was blamed. It was negotiation problems. It was all those crazy Russians. But we're starting to realize now, this was always Fedor's will. This was always the way he wanted it. He always has the final say. Always has the final say. He is surrounded by yes men right now. Not a single one of those people is capable of making a solid decision on their own. Every single one of them is acting on Fedor's interests. And sorry, as Fedor's request and for his own interest immediately there at that point. Whatever Fedor says is what goes. And that has been the way things have been operating since his return. He's made all the decisions himself. I've, I've myself posted the proof from the promoter for Fight Nights that Fedor handpicked his opponent for the event. He handpicked Fabio Maldonado. Mm. I understand. And a lot of people try to find a silver lining there. They're like, well, that was probably the best name on the list. Do you guys not understand what a conflict of interest is? Do you not understand what he's doing here? If this is the opponent he picked, how do you not know he didn't actually pick Jaideep Singh himself? How do you know he didn't actually pick opponents beforehand in Strikeford? How do we know what he's been leveraging with his power, with his name, with his reputation this whole time? It's been him all along that's been doing these things. Not someone else, not a shadow behind him. He hasn't been this ignorant or this little puppet or a doll or some fighter who's just all he wanted to do was fight and didn't understand business. Fedor's always understood business. He's always known how to do it. That's why he knew where to cut ties with people to maximize his money. He knew when to get rid of the team to make the most. Those millions of dollars now, most of it is going to go in his pocket, him and his wife, who's surprisingly also his manager now or supposedly his manager. It's a whole bizarre situation. It really, really is. Mm-hmm. Wow, that that just blows my mind. It's like yeah. one of those crazy movies with a huge twist at the end. I could just see Fedor sitting in a chair by himself, and then he turns around. And it's like dun, dun, dun. it was you all, you all along. But all right, so <laughs> just quickly, while we're still on this UFC thing, I just want to put my three cents in very, very quickly. I don't want to see him go to the UFC. I think it would look like you guys. I agree with you, but for the sense of fun, here's my sneaky Fedor plan. Okay. So he goes into the UFC for some reason. They still got Bigfoot Silver around, so I feel like maybe they'll try and create, and I don't know if this is possible, Kareem, but maybe a UFC event somewhere in Russia where he 
takes on Bigfoot Silva. They're hoping that he beats Bigfoot Silva. And then they have the big fight with Brock Lesnar if he has one more fight in the UFC. They build that thing up. Bang. And people are interested in it. And who knows? Because against Brock Lesnar, maybe he does have a chance of beating him. So that could be a fight that he could win. So that's my plan for Fatal. But it could also be Dana White and the UFC's plan for Fatal, where maybe they haven't been that happy with Fatal. And in this first fight, they put him up against Junior Dos Santos just to prove a point. So two, two, two <laughs> ways to go right. about it. I'd really prefer the first way if anyone <laughs> yeah. was, was listening. But my yeah, only, second way may only, happen as well. <laughs> my only objection there, and it's not even about the fight. Honestly, there's it's amazing that just because we're talking about Fedor, we can still see these, this possibility of him facing Antonio Silva and maybe potentially Brock Lesnar down the line. People will still talk about it. No mm. matter what happens yesterday, people will still want to talk about it. But... It's, it's it's bizarre, really. Like I don't understand what's left at this point for someone like Fedor to do. I, I, it, it's, it kills me, really. He should not be in the UFC. That's just my opinion on the matter. All right, so since we spoke about Fedor, let's talk about a man who was financially involved in his fight in Russia. Um, and I'm going to try and do my best to pronounce you his can name. You do this, Cass. I mean, you're the best pronouncer of Joanna's name. In the MMA media, I think you can do this. You're Ukrainian. I have no idea why you're not. I can't even pronounce this. my name. I can't even pronounce my name sometimes. Zia Ziavudin Magomadev, something like that. How did I do, yeah, Karim? Zia, yeah, Ziavudin Magomedov. B- Big Mago, if he was here in Australia, that's what they call him. <laughs> <laughs> so, for, th- for those who didn't read your your really in depth and very good article, Kareem, um, you know, you you took a look at his shady attempts. Can you explain your in depth article and what exactly it revealed? Okay, to simplify it so that the casual audience can truly understand this, you have to understand the way the Russian system, uh, the presidential system works in the first place. You can only, there was a time where you could only serve two consecutive terms of four years in presidential office, and that's exactly what Vladimir Putin did. And once his two terms were done, his two terms that ended quite well with ending the Chechen war and a lot of different things that he was doing, he what many believe was a sort of agreement that he would place his uh, prime minister, uh, Dmitry Medvedev, as president. And once that Medvedev's term was over, Putin would replace him because there was no limit to how many terms you would serve. You could just only serve them. You could only serve two consecutively. That was something Mm -hmm. Putin managed to put in as well into his into the law. So it was a sneaky tactic for him to still be able to continue in politics no matter what. So. During Putin's reign, there was a certain. You have to understand that when Yeltsin as well was in power, he privatized as soon as the as the Soviet Union collapsed. He privatized the entire economy and all sorts of industries for pennies. We're talking about the true original oligarchy of Russia rose at that point, and they were basically a representation of like the boyar system that came out of the medieval times in Russia. The boyars were sort of the nobility. The really truly powerful, rich nobility of uh, of old Tsarist Russia, way before even the Romanov time. We're talking about Ivan uh, Ivan Grozny, Ivan the Terrible, that sort of era. The boyars were very sneaky. They were able to influence politics. They were able to influence who was going to become Tsar. They were able to get them killed, etc. The same sort of power that oligarchs could possess, and they did have that sort of power over Yeltsin. But then came Vladimir Putin, very, very different kind of leader. He decided that, no, the best way for Russia would have been a lot more nationalizing. And that's what he intended to do. He took away a lot of power from a select group of people and decided that the people that he preferred, his own oligarchy was to be created, people he could trust himself. So he erased Yeltsin's Russia and created Putin's empire. The the thing was, he didn't expect that when Medvedev took over, in 2010, that Medvedev would end up trying to do the exact same thing. He once again reprivatized Russia for pennies, sold it off to a new oligarchical oligarchical system, and a whole new rank of random Russians became billionaires again. One of those was Zyavadin Magomedov. He rose with his Suma group, and he was given all sorts of state contracts by Dmitry Medvedev to build all sorts of things. And he rose to about 4 billion US dollars in terms of his value on Forbes by 2011. Wow. Now, he enjoyed himself quite quite well because Medvedev believed that Magomedov was the shining, the knight in shining armor of the Caucasus in the sense that he was this tall, light skin. This is a key point here because Russia is still quite racist. And I can say this openly because I've seen it with my own eyes, the difference in, in treatment for different people in different places. It changes a lot 
and it's, it's this cultural understanding of things. So they believe the white, and this truly happens in a lot of countries. I can say Egypt's at fault here, lighter skinned people and whatnot. This is a very old co colonial, st uh, basically rotten understanding that's just left over in these countries and still festers. But anyway, this is not part of the discussion at this point still. M Magomedov was seen as that perfect representation, tall, good-looking, well-dressed, uh, uh, articulate, uh, impressive, sharp, uh, intelligent. He had, all, he had it all. So they wanted to use him as well for tourism in the, in the region. They believed that Dagestan, all these places, had all sorts of potential because of the, the mountains. All they needed was to eliminate the violence that was happening in the region. And if they could get tourism to flourish, that would be a whole new source of revenue for Russia. So he assigned Magomedov that sort of thing. Well, that failed. And then Putin came back into power and said, well, I don't like any of you guys. Here's what's going to happen. We're going to get turn all these things into our state-run properties again. And that's what he did. He pressured a lot of things out of Magomedov's hands. He brought him down from $4 billion to $800 million. And I know we're still talking in millions, and I highly doubt most people listening will be in any way, shape, or form sad. But you have to understand <laughs> how significant that is. He was removed from that elite oligarchy status. That's a big deal in Russia when you're considered one of the top 90 or 80 richest people in the country. And when you're the richest people in the country in Russia, you're pretty much one of the richest people in the whole region. And that's a big continent to be that. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's status in itself. And when he lost that influence, he had to find a new way to regain it. So what did he choose to do? was multiple things. Sports diplomacy was one of them. As it's not very difficult to, to guess, Putin is very big on using athletes to improve on his own cult of personality. When Putin meets with Fedor, his own people are like, yes, this is, a, this is a president who understands what a real sportsman is. He knows what a man is and how fighters are. And I, I know this might sound ridiculous to some people listening, but you have to believe me that all this is very well calculated and part of that. When you see Putin on a bear, when you see him riding shirtless and all that, this is not a joke. It's a, it's a meme for us. I understand mm. that. But it's not a joke. It's very powerful. It tells the people that the president is healthy, he's well, he's well, he's alive and well, and he can actually enjoy himself. That's what things like that say. When you see him, I don't know, jumping into the water and trying to save something, when you see him diving out of a plane, when you see him at events and fighting or, 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 or working side by side with fighters, you see him in his judo uh, gi and whatnot. I, I believe it's a gi. Yeah, when you see him in, his, in, that, in, in the gi and whatnot, you, you tend to believe that, ah, this is a man of strength. This is the sort of person who should run Russia. And you really hear this from people. This actually does work. So this is exactly a tactic that Putin has used. And after mm. him, Khadirov has used as well, who has, who has created a whole cult of personality on his own based off Putin's version of it. So you see that it's very common in Russia, the whole concept of sports diplomacy to create better relations even on a global scale. There's a reason why Putin wanted to host the Olympics and why he wants the World Cup and why he's gotten both of them. As much as they're backfiring on him right now because of the anti-doping regulations, the hooliganism abroad at the Euro 2016, at the end of the day, this is still sports diplomacy and it's an essential tactic in his arsenal bag. It's essential to him. And you got to see a lot of that with Ziyavuddin Magomedov. He immediately attempted to purchase with what he had left a share in the UFC. Now, the UFC never responded to my request for information in that regard, so I will never know from their point of view whether this was actually a legitimate offer or not. But other sources and the promoter for Fight Nights, Camille Gaziev himself, actually stated that Ziavuddin did put in a bid and failed to get the UFC, which is why he instead decided, let's do this from within Russia. Let me try and improve Russian MMA myself, which is actually the line he says. I'm not saying that that actually was his intentions. I'll tell you in a moment what I believe his intentions were. Mm. When he purchased a share of Fight Nights, Fight Nights was a losing product. It lost well over 100 million rubles a year. Oh, this is wow. not numbers I'm making up. This is, if you read the article, I have the citation within the article from the equivalent of Forbes in Russia. So they have worked out the math themselves. I'm merely regurgitating that sort of that information. So you don't have to believe me if you don't want to, but they were most certainly a losing product. And even Vadim Finkelstein actually would happily go on any interview and admit this very publicly, that Russian MMA events do not profit very well from within Russia. If you're doing events in St. Petersburg and Moscow, etc., if you're doing them in Dagestan, Russia, if you're doing them in 
the Caucasus region in general, you're not going to profit. Truly profitable events are the ones that go abroad. Even if you're going somewhere as close as Kazakhstan, you can profit a lot more there than you're going to in actual in the actual Russian Federation. There's a lot of reasons for this. Wow, and that's Kazakhstan. honestly its own interview. There's actually its own interview in itself to really do that. But yeah, there's a reason why M1 goes off to Azerbaijan and Baku and places like that to do some of their events. They end up being a lot more profitable. There's other sponsors. There's other people who want to work with you in these regions who are willing to, ch- to, to, to help with that sort of financial flow that you might desperately need just to keep things going sometimes. it's And with the economy, with the recession, with the way it's going, this is also the reason why I don't think that that the plan of Fedor fighting for the UFC in Russia would ever truly work is because there's no the environment is terrible for it right now. There's nothing in the socio-political and economic environments in Russia that says that the UFC is going to be there anytime in the next few years. I will truly be shocked if we ever see a UFC event there. Well, it's not going to happen this year anyway, but I highly doubt we'll see it in 2017. And we'll be lucky if we see it in 2018. That's my opinion on the matter. But anyway, Ziavuddin. Honestly, the way I understand it, and I've been told this from very, very, very trustworthy sources, that the reason he invested in bringing along Fedor, the only reason Fight Nights was even able to offer Fedor a competitive bid was because Ziavuddin Magomedov had invested in the promotion. Now, even the, the equivalent that RBC dot RU equivalent of Forbes in Russia, even they were not able to get a legitimate quote out of Magomedov as to why he invested or how much he was how much he how much of a percentage of the company he has a lot of that is very uh un, is all unknown information so we don't really know how much of the how much of a say he has but from what we can understand is he's definitely in charge most of the money is coming from him at this point he's keeping them alive and well especially for an event like fedor apparently the budget was exorbitant for their events yesterday. You could see it from the way they present their shows and whatnot. Those aren't cheap events. Their arena was not very big. The Ice Palace does not take many people. I've seen M1 sell out that arena and still not profit from the show. The Ice Palace wow. does not make profitable numbers. I'm telling you this right now. It's just, it's just not going to happen. So there's no way. I would be extremely surprised if they broke even yesterday. I truly would be. There was no pay-per-view whatsoever for the show. I'm surprised it wasn't put on pay-per-view instead of Fight Pass, to be honest. There was no pay-per-view for the show. It was shown on free TV in Russia. And that's about it. Where's where's your TV money? There's no there's nothing. There's nothing coming from that. They weren't they don't if they don't no one pays them to be on to be on match TV. It doesn't work that way in Russia. <laughs> the rights uh, there's there's a certain rights deal for the year, but there wasn't a very specific deal made for Fedor. So Fight Nights really didn't make any money. There was one key reason why Magomedov was so interested in that event taking place on June 17th in Russia. And that was because he wanted Vladimir Putin present at the fight. He, and the reason he picked that date was because it coincided with the St. Petersburg International Economic Forum, which happens every two years in St. Petersburg, Russia. And Putin, of course, who is a St. Petersburg native, is always there. Magomedov believed that if he promoted a fight with Fedor, he would be able to have, to be able to say, Mr. Putin, you are invited to our show that evening. Once you're done with the work at the Economic Forum, we would be honored to have you at this event. And he apparently, according to sources, invited him numerous times and never got a true response from Putin. They were hoping to the last minute that he would show up, but... He was not there at the event. Did did Putin give him like a fader answer, like I am closer than ever before to attending your show, and then just not <laughs> not attending? From what I understand, there was no response at all. Mm. Busy washing his hair. So <laughs> Mega Mado <laughs> was... failed in that regard, and um, it didn't work out. Is that it? Do you think for his uh, experiment with MMA, do you think he sticks around a bit longer? Oh no, I believe he's going to stick around for sure. And if anything, he's going to try this again. He's going to try mm. very hard to do this because the re- it's he has a lot at stake than rather just what he lost in terms of the the Fedor fight. He has a lot more at stake. He's actually just recently invested in a lot of tech startup companies and technology and Hyperloop industry and all sorts of different things that, believe it or not, was the exact theme of this year's St. Petersburg International Economic Forum. It's as if he perfectly planned this. He's like, okay, I'm going to invest in these things and I'm going to get Putin at this event. I'm going to tell him that I invested in all the things that were at his forum and he's going to love me forever. Well, it doesn't really work that way. If you're not trustworthy to Putin, then you're not trustworthy to Putin. We've seen this. It's not like I'm making this up right now. This is a trend in history that we have seen. 
the tr people that Putin can trust, which are usually the people the United States can't stand, are the people that are still in power with him to this day. And the people he could no longer trust are the people that are nowhere near power. They are either dead in jail or <laughs> they're just useless and just weakened at power. They're still there. They still exist, but they're disgruntled and incapable of, of doing absolutely anything anymore. They, ha they can still live with their millions, but they have no influence. And for a lot of these oligarchs, it's not just about the money. It's about the influence as well. And that's definitely something Magomedov is very interested in. I want to switch topics. Um, and, and by the way, that was fantastic, insightful stuff, Kareem. I want to switch topics because we don't have you for too much longer. I want to talk about former belt or featherweight title contender in uh, Shabalu Shamalev. I think that's how you say his name. And uh, you wrote up an article about him. He had a near-fatal altercation in Dagestan. Some pretty crazy stuff. Some gunmen in a restaurant. What, what exactly happened, Kareem? Fill us in on the details we might be missing. Well, yeah, I actually found out about this one when I think I was... I think I was in Istanbul on my way to, to Baku when I first got a text from, from a friend of mine saying, did you hear what happened? You should go online. I sent you the, I sent you the link. And I, and I looked at what happened and I, and, I, and I called him up and we had a discussion because he's in Dagestan. He explained what had happened. But the way I, the way I was, it was referred to me was that he was going to make peace. So I'll tell you the guys the story from now and the mm -hmm. misunderstanding I first had on the phone with this, with this person was that Shamhala Shamhalaev actually encountered a politician the night before uh, June 1st, encountered a politician and his two bodyguards. And he got into a confrontation with the two bodyguards. Apparently, the politician was not too keen on, on Shambhalaev or just wanted to prove a point because he was a notable athlete. And you know, Dagestan is the sort of place where you think of it as a UFC fighter being at a bar and a drunk person coming up to him and trying to, trying to act all tough because he's a UFC fighter and this guy thinks, this drunk person thinks he can beat him up. There's been stories like this in the past. There's been people who just want to pick a fight and think they're tougher than the tough guy. And that happens in Dagestan. But when it happens in Dagestan, it's not a drunk, slurring idiot that does it. It's a very, very dangerous person armed with guns and generally very influential. So it becomes a big issue. And I think Shamhalaev was with a good friend of his. And that's when it is his good friend who ended up relaying the story to a journalist I know in Russia named Alexei Safanov. And the story is that Shamhala Shamhalaev encounter had had the confrontation and these one of the bodyguards before they got punches or anything shanghai was punched was slapped in the face and before he could turn around and do anything a gun was right at his head wow so shanghai shanghai apparently said the words shoot me if you're a man and the guy said and the guy pulls the gun away and says you meet me on the first day of summer which was june 1st for them and wow. Apparently, it was very interesting that it had to be me. Very the poetic and of romantic exactly. in a lot of ways, yeah. It was very poetic. I'm thinking, this is quite poetic for Dagestanis with guns that are about to kill each other. <laughs> 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 but anyway, so he, that's exactly what he does. He obliged. He went the following day. And the quote from the friend was one of the saddest things. It was, I cannot understand why Shambhalai would do this. Why would he go alone? Why would he go alone? It was repeated twice like that. As if he was so distressed by the idea that Shambhalai could be so... So silly to think that he could take these people on alone. It should have been obvious to him that he was being set up, basically. That's what, that's what the person was, was insinuating with that. Mm. And you see it from the camera footage. Shamala Shamhalaev, the first thing, in my, I never originally noted, and the first reports that came out did not have Shamhala Shamhalaev actually being the one with a weapon. The first report that came out said that he was in the restaurant and got shot. That was it. So when I originally wrote the Bloody Elbow article, that's what I mentioned. That he was in there and he got shot. Then the video w was released and it became clear that he was one of the people. He was actually the first person with a hoodie who walked into this fancy restaurant armed with a, with a hunting gun and a pistol. And this is Shamla Shamhaev, who's meant to be a sort of similar to Rashid Magomedov in the sense that he's very down to earth, very modest, very well liked by the community. People enjoy him. People think he's a very, very nice human being. He doesn't like a lot of media. He's very shy in general. Again, what they refer to as a peace-loving man, by Dagestani standards even, that this was, it was entirely shocking that he would walk in with this hunting gun and a pistol on the other hand. And what he went and did was he went into the room, deep looking in for the, for the politician, and behind him emerged the two bodyguards, and they just shot him in the back. And, they shot, and like, by the time he turned, like, you don't really see, the, you see the two guys firing the bullets in the camera, in the camera footage, but you don't actually see Shamhalaev getting shot. Of mm. course, you see the after effects in hospital, and you know that he was shot six times, including one bullet that grazed his head. Some people believe that there were rubber bullets involved. I asked a very close source, 
And I was told that there were no rubber bullets. They were real bullets that he was hit with, including the one that grazed his head. Wow. This is a very, very, very lucky human being to have survived what he did because those were close range shots as well. That he would say, you could see from, from the camera footage, it's, he should not have survived it, basically. But, and it missed, the bullets apparently missed all vital organs. There was originally the report that he had lost a kidney. Apparently, that was not, that's not the case. He did not even have to lose that kidney. He has basically woken up. He was actually, there's a picture on VK right now of a periscope session he had with a few people just this morning or something like that. He shaved his head. So he's looking like the old Shamhala, Shamhalaif again. But of course, he still looks very pale, very, his face sunken in. But the truth of the matter is it was worrisome for a while because he woke up from a coma. First thing he did was attack a nurse. Mm -hmm. The doctors later said that that was because of hallucinogenic, like the, the, the medication that was, he was given was so strong. He woke up a little too early and was still hallucinating. That was what the doctors said about that. So he, when he attacked the nurse, he was basically like trying to kick her away from him. Mm -hmm. And the second time when he woke up, he tried to actually escape. We're talking about someone who got shot six times, got up out of bed, ran out of the room, ran downstairs into the courtyard, dodged a few of the doctors, and then was finally stopped by a third one in the end. And at the same time, he's screaming, I want to go home. I want to go home. I want to go home. Now, a lot of people messaged me saying, was he afraid of something? Does he think someone was after him? Mm -hmm. I asked that exact same question to the same source again. And he said, no, I just think Shamala was nervous and he was tired of being in the hospital. That was the response I was given at the time. But then very interesting articles started to come out about the possible reasons why Shamhalai was ever targeted in the first place. And that's where things get a little messy. Apart from the idea that he had a random confrontation with a politician, some believe that it was more of a setup in general and that this politician was after him for a very specific reason. There's a gym in Dagestan called Gorets Gym. And that's the same gym where Ramazan Emiv, the current M1 global middleweight champion, trains at. And I wrote a couple of articles over the past couple of years. Every time I see Ramazan Emiv, there's a specific story I like discussing with him. And not because I generally like death, but it's just because it's the most interesting thing in his life in that regard, more than so than his fighting career. He's not exactly a big talker. He's very much a Dagestani, stays very quiet, keeps to himself in that regard. But he was always happy to talk about his coach and mentor who was murdered and assassinated, mm. basically gunned down, hitman style, by, by unknown, unknown uh, assailants a couple of years ago. And it was believed to be a very politically uh, charged murder. Why? Because it was later found out that the old mayor of Dagestan had very big relations to that team and to that coach in general. And that that coach had some, let's call them unsavory ties to the, to the mayor. The mayor, whenever he needed enforcers, etc., he used that gym for his enforcers. Right. So there's a relationship there that, was, that existed. And obviously when that mayor left office... That coach was no longer in basically everyone's good books. So he was, became a target and he was assassinated. And when I mean assassinated, he was standing, he was in his car on the highway and <laughs> the car that was next to him fired 28 shots into him. <laughs> 28. This is exactly Godfile, the Godfather style murder. I was going to say, exactly. not, not, not enough. Not enough shots. I think I, think I needed to <laughs> Jesus Christ, 28. They wanted, to make sh they wanted to make sure he died about five times. Wow. <laughs> wow. It's like um, it's like the end of training day where they attack Denzel Washington. Now, <laughs> yeah. Karim, we know how busy you are. We know how uh, we really appreciate the time that you gave us. I mean, before we let you go, is there, are there any more stories, anything else that you want to share with the people from your time in Russia? Anything else that stands out in your head? As, as, as a good story that you want to share with the people? Good stories that I want to share. I think everything that I write about is a little more depressing than it is fun and, <laughs> and, and interesting at this point. I've written stories about Jeff Munson getting fooled and tricked by promoters in Russia. That was he a good he read, was, yeah. Oh, I, well, I, thought, I legitimately thought that I couldn't believe it when he called me up to tell me the story. He was... If you could, if you could hear the, the way his voice sounded, he sounded like he couldn't understand. He was so confused and upset with what had happened to him. That's why I felt like I had to relay it as more in story form than in, as simply as a news article, because I felt people had to really understand the emotions he was going through mm -hmm. and how trusting he seemed to be. The promoter would not respond to me. So, interestingly enough, he was happy to speak to Russian outlets once my article was released, but he was not willing to discuss it beforehand, which was very interesting. I guess when he realized that there was no way around it in the end, that's when he was willing to discuss it. So there's always that story. People should really go in and read that and understand 
as much as people, I, it was really disappointing because people would respond and say something like, well, that's what Jeff Munson gets for going to fight in Russia. I mean, really, people oh, are, are just, some people are a little too callous and they don't understand what's at stake for a lot of people. Mm. Why does everybody who is not in, in your country or does not stay with you, does not accept what you think is right, why does he have to be your enemy? Why do you have to wish harm on him? I don't understand that. Mm. And at the same time, then you get the contrast when I write about something about Vyacheslav Datsik, for instance, and his crazy run That's a crazy with... story, actually. For people that don't know, can you sort of tell us a little bit about that? Because I was reading oh, yeah. about that, and I just couldn't believe some of the stuff that you wrote down. Oh, I, so, well, I certainly can. He was that. He's, he's renowned as the crazy heavyweight who knocked out Andrei Arlovsky in, in Arlovsky's... Uh, Pro MMA debut, I believe. Yeah. If I'm not mistaken, guys. I'm not quite sure if it was the debut or it was one of those early fights. If you haven't seen that video, you need to watch Whoa. it. I think he's wearing like some black leather pants and he, <laughs> he looks possessed yeah. at one point. That's a crazy video. Well, yeah. He, when the, there's a commentator who speaks to him right afterwards and he only responds with a big scream. That's it. <laughs> yeah. And he just runs off. Yeah. And she just asks him a question. He looks at her and goes, ah, he's a big giant scream. I'm like, whoa, whoa, what's going on here? Mm. He's always been very crazy. And I knew for a while he's about to be released from prison. I wrote a very quick news piece saying, listen, guys, he's about to be released from prison. This is what he did. This is his history. He was he had a history of mental illness. And he went to jail because of robberies. He actually fled. He actually, And then they, they put him in a mental institution in Norway because he fled to Norway. He actually <laughs> escaped prison in Russia. Like, I think, I believe, swam across to Norway. Like, he, he did some insane stuff, apparently, to get to Norway, where he ended up getting thrown, put into a psychiatric ward. He escaped that psychiatric ward by ripping his way through the fence. Jeez. I remember reading about <laughs> that, yeah. It's just insanity, the things that happened to him. Of course, he was deported back to Russia, where they held him in captive for, for years, and they finally released him, from what I understand, because they couldn't tolerate him anymore. They had, his term was up, and they <laughs> truly did not want to extend it. He was just trouble, even in jail. Wow. Let me tell you what's happening now. So they released him. The first thing he goes and does is sets up this YouTube page where he's become this vigilante out out as a he, he, what does he refer to himself as? Uh, I'm sorry, guys. I'm so tired. He refers to himself as the, the Red Tarzan. Oh, yeah. And basically, I believe that's a reference to some sort of old Slavic god. I'm not sure about the Tarzan, but the, the mention of red specifically is a reference to an old Slavic god. Mm -hmm. And he sees himself as basically that bringer of justice. So what he was going and doing was setting up these pages and going on the streets and trying to cleanse it of impurities. So impurities would be uh, non-white people, basically. So it's a lot of this white power, horrendous garbage. Mm -hmm. And uh, a lot of he, he, what he did, which is what I specifically wrote about, was the prostitutes. He went into... Uh, into brothels and attack the sex workers, strip them of their clothes. This is all being, this is all filmed, and I made sure not to attach any of these videos. People actually messaged me complaining. They say I was, I was my duty to show the videos. I disagree entirely. Mm -hmm. There was absolutely no. I believe my writing described everything vividly enough. I did not mm -hmm. hide any facts from the public. I was, I was angered when no it, reason. I was angered just by what I read, not because yeah. of you, but it was the kind of yeah. article that you read and you think about such a damaged human being, and you, you, it's so infuriating that you can't do exactly. something about it. You know, right? yeah. and the words and the words that you used. I mean, you get a mental image in your brain straight away. So yeah. definitely, the videos weren't necessary. Oh yeah, I, I agree. And this and this was actually something that we discussed with the SB Nation higher ups, and we all agreed that this was just way too sensitive to include any videos. I believe we made the right decision in that regard. But I can tell you right now, guys, if you were infuriated by the the words, I was sickened the whole day. I could barely eat. I could barely focus. I couldn't understand how a country that I enjoyed so much, that I respected so much, and the culture wise, and just, just, just beauty of St. Petersburg and places like Moscow. And this person is in St. Petersburg, by the way, which is one of my favorite cities in the world. Mm. How it can still produce such slime and garbage? And it was, it was just disgusting to see. So the fact that he was going into brothels, stripping the women there, a lot of them were, were uh, African. So this is something he believed was his right as well. He was superior to all these people. He was stripping them naked, taking pictures and robbing all the men, basically, and throwing them out, telling them, you uh, don't do this again, basically. Basically, a slap on the wrist to the men and taking the women downstairs and parading them on the street and walking them down the streets of St. Petersburg, pointing at old like windows and waking people up from like around the neighborhoods, telling them, watch the whores, watch the whores as we take them to, to the police station. 
Mm-hmm. He was legitimately walking these people to the police station. So you have to imagine the police are looking outside and saying, what on earth is going on? They're arresting him instead of the... And then they arrest him instead of the sex workers. It's just insanity. You can tell that he has a screw loose because anybody in their right mind wouldn't be doing anything like this. Mm-hmm. Yet he has a team of people who apparently he is scared into doing these things. And when he's in jail, he's telling people to... He's made apparently everyone in his cell in his cell to, to quit smoking and to start training mixed martial arts for his own amusement. And he's that capable of doing that. He's, he knows how to spark that sort of fear in people. Mm-hmm. Well, you look so that's at, what we're dealing with. <laughs> you look at pictures of him, and I mean, he looks completely different since the Andre Alovsky fight. He just... Oh, indeed. Menace to society doesn't even begin to describe him. And I mean, needless to say, Marvel will not be doing a Red Tarzan movie anytime oh. soon. I don't, I don't think he's making the cut. And <clears throat> I joke about it now. I like to sort of bring out the lighter side of things. But yeah, when I, I remember reading that article, and it was so infuriating that scum like this, you know, exists in the world. But Kareem, we could hug you all day. And uh, you have delivered just insane amounts of insight on this on this show today. Um, we don't we don't want to hug you all the time. We'll have to get you on in the future. You are as the the M1 Global uh, PR people call you the man on the plane. You are always <laughs> in and out of Russia. You are always traveling. So I'm sure that next time we get you on the show, which hopefully will be a lot sooner, um, you'll have tons more stories for us and uh, tons of you know eye eye opening things to tell us. So just want to say hugely uh, appreciate you coming back on the show. You guys, of course, can follow Kareem on Twitter for all his latest updates at Zidane Sports and look out for all of his articles on Bloody Elbow. Again, thank you so much for chatting with us, Kareem. We always enjoy it. Thank you for having me on, guys. You know, I, I love I love what you guys do. I love being on here, and it's an absolute pleasure to come on and talk to you guys every time.